A warm welcome to everyone uh, to a new uh, uh, 10 minutes uh, interview with one of our international members. Um, I am Carla Sassi, convener of IASL, um, and uh, it is my pleasure to introduce today's guest, Dr. Zeke Stroh from the University of Münster uh, in Germany. Uh, Zilke studied Anglophone literature, German literature, political science and Celtic studies at the universities of Aberdeen and Frankfurt, where she obtained an MA in 2000 and a PhD in 2006. She is currently senior lecturer at the English department of Münster University, but she has also taught at the universities of Frankfurt, Gießen, Mainz, all in Germany, and Basel um, in Switzerland. As far as Scottish literature goes, her work both as a researcher and a teacher has always been informed by a comparative cross-cultural approach and more specifically by her interest in post-colonialism, diaspora studies and the relationship between minority issues and national identity. Uh, furthermore, she has worked both on Anglophone and Gallic material and beyond Scottish studies, she has also worked and published on different international contexts, such as Anglophone Africa, Canada and New Zealand. She has published widely, I will just mention here two monographs, but there is, of course, much more. Uh, Uneasy Subjects, Postcolonialism and Scottish Gaelic Poetry, published in 2011 and Gaelic Scotland in the Colonial Imagination, Anglophone Writing from 1600 to 1900, published in 2017. Finally, I would like to remember that Zilka has been an active supporter of Scottish studies internationally for several years. Um, she has served on committees both at ASLS and IASL, and she is currently a member of the steering committee of IASL Third World Congress of Scottish Literatures, which will take place in Prague in 2022, as we all know. So welcome, Zika. It is great to have you here. And uh, today we are going to find out about your recent and current research projects and also um, your classes in Scottish literature uh, at uh, Münster. Um, and we will start from your most recent publication, uh, that is the special issue of the Scottish uh, of the Scottish Literary Review, just published June 2021, um, by the suggestively alliterative title "Mosques, Muirs, and Moors." Sorry, mosques, manses, muirs, and moors: representations of Muslims and Islam in Scottish culture, and that was uh, co-edited um, with Manfred Malson. Um, this is the first extensive investigation on this topic, so we would certainly like to hear something about the genesis and development of this project. Um, many thanks, Carla, for this introduction and many thanks for inviting me. It's a great pleasure. Um, yeah, the rationale of the project. Um, well, as you've already said in the introduction, I've always been greatly interested in the different ways in which literature negotiates cultural diversity. Uh, and I started out by focusing mainly on Highland and Gaelic issues. And then in recent years, I've increasingly also got interested in um, other facets of Scottish cultural diversity. Um, for example, more recent uh, minorities in Scotland, the South Asian diaspora, Afro-Scots, etc. Uh, so I also started getting more interested in Scottish Muslims and also in representations of Muslims by non-Scots. Um, and I think Manfred, he teaches at the United Arab Emirates University in Al Ain. So and being a Scottish literature expert who's been based in a Muslim country for over 20 years, I think for him it also came quite naturally asking about connections. And uh, one other reason behind the project was that, of course, in recent years, there's been quite a considerable boom in publications that looked at cultural representations um, by Westerners of Muslim cultures, um, neo-Orientalisms, etc., cetera, um, but also um, Muslims in the West, British Muslim fiction, etc. But we found that very often these studies say British, but they actually mean English. And um, 
we felt that a more devolved perspective was needed. And historians and sociologists have already started. There's a couple of very important and interesting studies on Scottish Muslim histories and also Scottish Muslim sociology, but very little by way of literary studies, except for studies of a few individual and rightly famous authors such as Leila Abu Leila, and we just thought would widen the perspective a little bit. Now, obviously, a special issue cannot be a comprehensive coverage, but we thought we'd um, at least try and give a couple of spotlights on areas that had not been much discussed before, and then hopefully encourage other scholars to do more work in the area. Fantastic. Um, looking forward to reading it. I'm still waiting for my copy. It's on, on its way. Um, and you also told me something um, of your fascinating current project um, and focused on narratives of transmigration and uh, on, on the story of a small Scottish diasporic group that quite literally traveled across the world in the 19th century. So um, I'm, I'm very interested in hearing more about this uh, project, a preview for our viewers as well. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, yeah, well, something else I've been getting increasingly interested in was the Scottish diaspora overseas. Uh, and I've also been interested um, for many years in colonial writing. Uh, so I thought I'd do something on British settler discourse and not just Scottish, but, but also other settlers. But I've got a main case study from Scotland indeed. So I thought, um, of course, quite a number of colonizers changed continents. Um, more than once. So if you think of people in the army, the civil service, gold diggers often moved, merchants, of course, etc. But I think nonetheless, our classical image of the colonial migrant is very really often still this little house on the prairie cliche, somebody who moves, settles somewhere rural, does some so-called pioneering, and then settles in after a while and becomes a Canadian or Australian or whatever. Um, and I wanted to look in more detail at people who didn't, who moved long distance several times, and then how this affects the way in which they talk about identity, home and place in an era in the 19th century when nation state is still so important, it's at its heyday, um, territoriality is so important. So obviously um, nowadays we're quite used to ideas of multiple migration, but we always think of the contemporary, don't we? We think of hypermobility of global business people, etc. But I was curious of how this kind of mobility played out in a much less mobile age or where there was mobility but it was more difficult to travel about and communication was slower etc and ideologies were different so that's the main rationale behind that and um, my main case study as I said is from the Scottish diaspora even though I've also got others um, and the group is normally referred to as the Normanists or the Waipu community so they're a group of Highlanders who well obviously um, try to get away from the economic changes, clearances, threats of rising rents, etc. But also, um, there was already the first stirrings of, um, you know, what later became the disruption of the church. So uh, they broke with established church um, in the 1810s and then came, well, moved to Nova Scotia from the Highlands first. Um, stayed in Nova Scotia for over 20 years and then decided they wanted a warmer climate and then went on to Australia and then didn't like it there and then moved on to New Zealand. And that's where most of them ended up. And I found them very interesting because it's not just individual or small family groups that did this very, um, you know, multiple migration, but an entire community. Those who did the New Zealand leg of the journey amounted to about 900 people. Um, and they went successively, um, you know, not all on one ship, but in successive boats. Um, and I found that quite interesting. Um, and sometimes that's covered in history books, but again, there's very little in literary studies about them, even though there's also quite a considerable corpus of literary texts. And it's also, of course, possible to read the histories as literature, as narratives, and focus more on representation patterns, ideologies, metaphors, than just on the facts. So I thought I'd do the first literary history of this community as part of my wider project on multiple migration. Fascinating. We will look forward to the publication of this monograph, um, very likely, right? Okay, so my final question is for your classes in Scottish literature at the University of Munster. Um, and you explained me that um, 
within the German system, lecturers and teachers are quite free to design their courses the way they want to design them. So I would like to hear how you design your courses um, in Scottish Literature University of, of uh, Münster and how you approach uh, this subject uh, there. Uh, yeah, um, well, indeed, we're, we're quite happy um, with this freedom that we're getting. So we have a few introductory courses, like most universities around the world have, introduction to literature in the first year, etc. But after that, um, most of the seminars are developed in you in every semester. Um, we're greatly encouraged to do that. We are allowed to repeat, but we don't have to repeat. And um, so we, we get to cover quite a range of subjects without any bureaucratical obstacles, which is wonderful. Um, and the students are also quite used to, um, you know, having subjects offered to them that they might not be used to. So they tend to be very open-minded, which is wonderful. Um, so what I try to do is um, I have occasional specialized courses just in Scottish literature. Sometimes they're general introductions, um, you know, for, for students who are totally new to the subject, but cover quite a range of, of centuries. I've also done an introduction just for Gaelic studies that was cultural society from the Middle Ages to the present coupled with a language course that was a bit of a challenge but it was interesting so it was a taster. Um, and I've also for example in recent years done a course on Scottish um, history in fiction from Scott to Diana Gabaldon. Um, so um, yeah. Um, Often also I make combinations. So I just do Scottish literature as an element of a wider comparative course. Um, for example, at the moment I'm doing actually one on Zimbabwe and the Zimbabwean diaspora. And then the diaspora element is largely covered by Tendai Huchu, who of course is based in Edinburgh. So I got the Scottish side in that way. And it's kind of nice because it gives a more global perspective. Or last semester I had a course on um, post-colonialism and culture memory. Um, so we looked at colonial legacies in Scottish museums, overseas legacies, um, and um, also, of course, the street names, if we think of Glasgow's Merchant City, for example. Um, so the students, I think, quite, quite enjoy this, this global perspective, and because they're all we're very strong in post-colonial studies, so they all get a good introduction in first year to minority issues, cultural diversity, multilingual societies, and then they tend to be quite keen on Scotland as well, because it's, of course, a, a British example where there's a lot of diversity going on. And certainly Germany has a great tradition when it comes to the teaching and studying of Scottish literature. So perhaps um, it's a more favorable background in many ways. Well, Zika, thank you so much for your time and for this very interesting interview. Um, uh, you're well known among uh, Scottish studies specialists, uh, but I hope that this interview will help uh, get your work known better uh, across borders. So thank yeah. you. <laughs> Thank you again. Thank you.